Good morning, everyone, and happy Sabbath. Right, I guess it's time for us to go through the Sabbath school study for this week. Well, before we start, I would like us to bow for a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to come before thee in this holy Sabbath and to study under the feet of Christ. It is always a blessing to gather together to study your word, the word of life. We are pleading and inviting the Holy Spirit into our midst. The carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. And so we need Christ to help us appreciate and understand your word. Come and lead in this study, and come and preserve our hearts, prepare our hearts to be receptive of your word. Please bless us as we go through the study for today. In Jesus' name have we prayed with thanksgiving. Amen. Right, so we continue the study of the book of Genesis. And this is the lesson 11, captioned Joseph, Master of Dreams. And it's, it's really interesting that I have to lead the study, I mean the beginning of the study of Joseph because we share the same name, and I wish I could meet Joseph in person because it's fascinating studying about him in times like this. Now, the memory test is taken from Genesis chapter 37, verses, verse 19, and I read, Then they said to one another, Look, this dreamer is coming. I want to repeat the memory test. Then they said to one another, look, this dreamer is coming. Now the story of Joseph is captured in Genesis chapter 37 to chapter 50. And so that covers the last section of the book of Genesis. And that is, we are talking about his, his first dreams in Canaan to his death in Egypt. And so it looks like Genesis, J Joseph occupies more space in the book of Genesis than does any other patriarch. And so he is presented in Genesis as a great patriarch, just like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, because the book of Genesis is really, I mean, dedicated to treat the, the story of Joseph. Now, as we, we will see throughout the study, the life of Joseph highlights two important theoretical truths. And I want us to, I mean, picture this and meditate upon this as we go through the study, because every detail will highlight these important truths about Scripture. Number one, God is a way maker, and he is a promise keeper and he fulfills his promises. This is number one truth that the book, I mean, the story of Joseph highlights. God fulfills all his promises. And so, I mean, when I was reading this at our school, I was really motivated and inspired that whatever promise God has with us, he will surely fulfill that. We have an example, many pages in the book, I mean, in the Bible where God fulfills his promises, and the book, I mean, the story of Joseph is one of them. And then the second important theoretical truth that we realize here is that God is a master of circumstances. He is able to change our circumstances and turn evil into good. I guess you all agree with me, and we will see this clearly happen as we go through the book, as we did. I mean, we are only summarizing the study today. And so, this study will focus on the early life of Joseph. We know that he's Jacob's favorite son, 
who is ironically nicknamed the dreamer, as the title of the lesson goes, Joseph, master of dreams. Well, we, we, we have seen in the life of Joseph that he is an expert of dreams, if we had studied the Sabbath school. And so this title fits him very well because he not only receives, understands, and interprets prophetic dreams, but he also fulfills them in his life as well. And we will see that, I mean, all this unfold as we go through the lesson summary for today. Well, let's zoom into the Sunday's lesson, which talks about family troubles. The title is Family Troubles. Now, well, this lesson is based on chapter 37, verse 1 to 11. I'll read that in a little bit, but before I read, I want to read a caption that Jacob has settled in the land while Isaac was only a stranger. The text also says that Jacob dwelt in the land. And so yet it was then, as he was settling into the land, that the troubles begin. This time from inside his family. The controversy does not concern the possession of the land or the use of a world as normally it would be. But this time the controversy is more spiritual. And I want to take a quick read of the book of Genesis chapter 37, verses 1 to 11. I mean, for us to digest what the word of God say about this. Genesis 37, 1 to 11, I read. And Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. Now, as I continue to read, I want you to meditate on this question and we will discuss this after the reading. What family dynamic predisposed Joseph's brothers to hate him so much? Think about this question, and we find answers to this after the reading. So I continue with the reading. Verse 2. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being seven, 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren, and the lad was with the sons of Bilhah, and with the sons of Zippah, his father's wives, and Joseph brought unto his father their evil reports. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children, because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peacefully unto him. And Joseph dreamed, dreamed a dream, and he told it to his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. And he said unto them, Here I pray you, this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose and also stood upright, and behold, your sheaves stood round upright about and made ob obeisance to my sheaf. And his brethren said to him, Shall thou indeed reign over us? Or shall thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet more for his dreams and for his words. And he dreamed yet another dream and told it to his brethren and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more and more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. And he told it to his father and to his brethren. And his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamt? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee to the earth? And his brethren envied him, but his father observed the saying. Well, if we follow this reading carefully, I, I want us to try to bring the lesson from here in, in the context of the question that what family dynamic predisposed Joseph's brothers to hate him so much? 
Yeah, I mean, anybody who wants to bring a point out can discuss this in the context of this question. Okay. Right, raise your hand. Yeah. Right, right, Edma. Yeah, good morning. Good morning. Yeah, in my opinion, I think the, the problem was envy, right? Mm. Because Jacob just showed favoritism to Joseph. Mm. The brothers became envy about it. Mm. And what the lesson does it, I mean, give to us? Is that okay? Should we be doing that as parents? I mean, what lesson do you think we can learn from this? Showing favoritism among your, your family members or your children, to be precise. I think this kind of... Uh, can I say, uh, this action, right, me brings a kind of trouble in, in, in the family, right? Mm, mm. <clears throat> however, however J Jacob just showed, you know, favoritism to, towards Joseph, you know, right. the, the envy action the, didn't help, you know, the family in a, in a, in a general way. Right. Bringing, you know, negative consequences in future, you know. Right. Into the family. Right. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Edma. We've got to love everybody equally, right? I yep. guess that's the point. Yeah. Equality. Really. Equally, yeah. Yes. Need to love, show love to everybody equally. I sure. guess that's your point, right? Thank yep. you. Is there any other person who wants to make a point? I guess there are many uh, instances that led to the hatred in his brothers. And I mean, Edma pointed out one important point. Is there anybody who also thought of another thing that we want to take note of in this test? Okay. Joseph wasn't all that diplomatic himself because with the rivalry that he was already aware of that existed in his family, for him to be telling these dreams so, you know, mm. probably boastfully almost maybe, I, I think that was wrong for him to, to, be, to be forward in yeah, sharing. Yeah. It, it probably would have been fine if he had shared the dreams with his father and his mm. mother only. Mm. Uh, well, his, of course his mother had gone, but uh, with his father, but um, to be sharing them with the brothers where there were already ill feelings, mm. I think that was something he could have avoided if he wanted to work on better re family relationships. Right, yeah. right, that's true, yeah. Yeah, I think that is a lesson to us. At times we need to be tactical when addressing some of these in our families. We may end up harming people than doing good, and we may cause hatred among our brethren like than bringing them together in one fold. Yeah, I think one point that I also saw in this is that Joseph would report his brothers to the father about any reprehensible behavior, like if we followed that. So he was kind of reporting like things to the father. I don't know whether he had already talked to the brothers and they refused or something, so then it has to go to the father. But if you are seen doing that, like always trying to, I don't know how Joseph, like, I wish I could meet Joseph in person to ask him why he was doing some of the things after reading this. But, well, my point is that probably at times if we find a fault of people, we want to approach them in person, talk to them about it. Then if they refuse and keep on doing it, then we may want to go extra mile to tell people about it. I don't know if you are getting my point, but being in a quick to report people, I don't think that is a great thing. And that also probably is one of the reasons why the brothers hated him so much. They hated him so much. So that is something we want to be careful about. Joseph was sharing his dreams, and most of the dreams suggested that God would put him in a higher position, and that they, his brothers, would bow before him, and that caused them to hate him even more, as the Bible says. 
And what one thing, lesson that I, I learned from this is that I think God has his plans for everybody. And God has chosen some individuals to perform specific tasks. Whether you envy them or not, that will not change God's decision for those people. You, you know what I mean? Like Joseph was chosen by God for a special task. Though his brothers hated him and they did all they could, as the, uh, the, the lesson says, they could not change God's intention for him. So what I, normally we meet people, they have special characteristics, features, special uh, fruits of the spirit, like they exhibit unique gifts. And we, instead of coming to closer to the people, love them, and probably learn from them, we tend to hate them because of their gifts. And I, I think this is what was happening in the time of Joseph. The father loved him, that creates enemy, as we discussed. He has gifts, he has dreams. We suggest that he was going to be very great. That created a lot of enmity. Joseph was a man of integrity, so you do things which are not right, and he reports you to the father to correct that mistake, and that also generated a lot of hatred against him. Instead of people coming together to learn some of these great attributes from him, they rather tend to hate him, and this is normally common in our world today. So I think these are some of the things we want to learn from me. So the genuine prophetic character of the dreams was even ratified by the fact that they are repeated. It was genuine, right from God. Now there's this thing Jacob did that I want us to note. The lesson says, although Jacob openly rebuked his son, we, we remember when we're reading the text, when Joseph revealed his dream, he suggested that we we're going to bow to him Jacob openly rebuked Joseph, but he kept this incident in his mind, meditating on its meaning and waiting for its fulfillment. And so the implication is that perhaps deep down he thought there might be something to these dreams after all. He was right, however much he couldn't know it all the time. And so Jacob felt that this is something unique and it might be fulfilled. I mean, what God says, no one can I mean, stop God from what he wants to do. So he was looking forward to this. And I think as parents or something like that, when we see our children growing in a certain path, we should always be praying and looking forward to greatness for our children. Maybe it may not be in favor of what we might want the child to do, but as far as it is not against the will of God, I guess we should be supporting such a cause. And so jo Jacob was looking forward to seeing this happen in his time. Right, we, we continue with the lesson. All this as we... Oh, right, right. You, got, you have a yeah. point, right? Yeah, it's interesting to Joseph that uh, when... Joseph would have spoken to his father, Jacob, mm. about his dreams. Mm. If there was ever any father who could have encouraged his son in realizing that this was indeed, you know, from God, it mm. would be Jacob because Jacob had had his own dream experience with God. Definitely. So he knew God had spoken to him in a dream. In dreams, so now this is my son. So mm. the, it, it's unfortunate that Jacob had the response that he did. Mm. And I'm sure that didn't help in the, uh, although I know he was still favored by Jacob, mm. but that didn't help Jacob, or Joseph, pardon me, that didn't help Joseph in feeling that God was actually now speaking to him. I think Jacob might have put a little doubt in Joseph's mind. Right. So, you know, again, parents and children and how they relate, um, yeah, very, very important that we, we look at it from all angles. Right, yeah. right. Thank you so much for this point, Margaret. Yeah, I would want to continue with 
chapter 37, verse 12, I will stop at some point, but I want to make a point here, so I'll read a little bit. And his brethren went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. And, is, and Israel said unto Joseph, Do not thy brethren feed the flock in Shechem? Come, and I will send thee unto them. And he, he said to him, Here am I. And he said to him, Go, I pray thee, see whether it be well with thy brethren and well with the flocks, and bring me word again. So he sent him out of the vale of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. And a certain man found him, and behold, he was wandering in the field. And the man asked him, saying, What seekest thou? And he said, and he said I seek my brethren. Tell me, I pray thee, where they feed their flocks. And the man said, They are departed hence. For I heard them say, say Let us go to Dothan. And Joseph went after his brethren, and found them in Dothan. Well, as we continue to read this, because of time, I may not read everything there, but we realize the attack that came upon Joseph. And they all came because of the hatred that was generated against Joseph. Now, Joseph was a good man. The father sent him to give food to the brethren on the field. He still boldly accept the call and willing to offer help to the brethren who was at the field, but then they also had another mind. Now, one point that I want to point it out that the Sabbath school makes it clear is that, I mean, when the Lord is with you, almost all the time when you are in trouble, the Lord intervenes. Joseph went to Shechem, and he couldn't find his brothers there, wandering on the field here and there. But then a man found him and asked him what he wanted. He showed him power and it worked. Joseph found his brethren in, in Dothan. Well, I want to ask this question before I forget. So the, the question is, what does these teach us with what I read and knowing the story where the brothers plotted to kill him, I mean, Reuben suggested that they put him in the pit, and eventually they didn't kill him. What does this teach us about how dangerous and evil unregenerate hearts can be, and what they can lead any one of us to do? The story of Joseph, they planned to kill him. Reuben intervened. They didn't kill him. They put him into a pit, and then eventually killed an animal, I mean, soiled his coat of many colors with animal blood. They sold him, as we know the story, soiled it with the blood, came home and told the father that your beloved son is gone. What does this story tell you? One of them, they are just a sibling to their brethren, but they couldn't look at what the consequences, killing or selling your brother, what does this tell you of, about how human beings can be? I, I want us to speak into this a little bit, generally on the story, and what that tells us of our own attitude, what we can do. Right. Yeah, Margaret wants to speak. Yeah, I think uh, uh, the unregenerate heart mm -hmm. is one that thinks only of self, mm. Uh, you know, I mean, we know that selfishness is one of the greatest sins. Right. And I think with them, they were thinking of what is good for me. Mm. They couldn't even put their father mm. in the scenario here. What will this do to our father when we take back this word to him? Mm. You know, it was only themselves. Mm. And they had become so hardened mm. in their dislike for, for Joseph mm. that they, they couldn't even talk to him. So, you know, relationships had totally broken down. Um, they didn't want anything to do with him. They regarded him as a, a, a person who didn't really exist as far as they were concerned, mm. except someone to treat with evil. Mm. And it's interesting, the, um, you know, you would have thought that if there, was, if there were any brothers or half stepbrothers who would have helped Jacob, it would have been um, his mother's um, nurses, not nurse, but what was the, 
or servant, his mother's servant's boys. Right. But no, it was Leah's sons who helped. And that encouraged me because I'm sure there must have been rivalry between Leah and, right. and her sister. Right. But you know, there, we know there was rivalry between them, but yet it was Leah's boys who, I mean, they weren't kind, but they were kinder than the others. The others wanted to kill him. Definitely. But Leah's boys said, first of all, let's put him in a pit. Right. And I think the indication is that he probably would have gone back and gotten him out. And the other one said, well, let's not kill him. Mm-hmm. You know, at least let him live, sell mm-hmm. him, we'll get something. Mm-hmm. You know, so as bad as their thoughts were, they were mm-hmm. far better mm-hmm. than what the other boys were. Mm-hmm. Uh, I say boys, they would have been grown men, of course, but right. uh, what the others were thinking. Yeah, but oh. selfishness, selfishness, right. that was uh, what the unregenerate heart was really uh, uh, speaking from. Right, right, right. Yeah, I mean, that's a great point, Margaret. Thank you for this. Yeah, so it's, it's like, so the Sabbath School says it's hard to imagine the kind of hatred expressed here, especially for someone of their own household, which is really crazy. Like, how could these young men have done something so cruel? Did they not think even for a few moments about how this would impact their own father? I, I try to put myself in, in Jacob's shoes, like they come in to inform him of, of his son's death. Like, I mean, he would regret for even sending Joseph to the field in the first. Why should I even send this boy to give food to the brothers? I believe he had a lot of regrets going through his mind and so remorseful, like, I mean, he couldn't help it. And the, the, the brothers couldn't think through all this, what their father would go to, like Margaret was, was saying, but well, they still decided to do what would please them. But, I mean, glory be to God that he's always intervening and providing for Joseph whenever he needed. And so after they cast him into the pit, planning to kill him later, later a caravan passes, and Judah proposes like, Margaret was saying to his brothers to sell Joseph to them. After Joseph is sold to the Midianites, the Midianites also sell him to someone in Egypt, thus anticipating his future glory. After all, let's not kill him to just be responsible for his blood. Let's sell him. That was God's intervention because everything was pointed to the fact that they were going to kill their boy. But God intervened and they sued him instead of killing him. Right, then the, we, we see the story of Judah and Tamar coming into play, Genesis chapter 38. And so the Sabbath school is, say, is saying is that the, the story of Tamar is not out of place here because like the normal thing that will come to mind is we are talking about Joseph, why Judah and Tamar. But this incident follow, follows chronologically the sale of Joseph in Egypt. And it is consistent with the fact that Judah has just left his brothers. It points to his disagreement with them. Normally, this is what I've seen happen. When people connive to do evil, it it normally happens that after the incident or the act, there's kind of disagreement between them and their separation. Normally, when it happens that way, then the secret which was not supposed to be revealed comes out because, like, they hit each other and people start talking outside. I feel that this is what happened to the brothers, kind of disagreement, like probably somebody saying, I told you not to sell Joseph, and they see their father in torture, like the father is mourning, and they cannot take it. And then they start to accuse each other. Well, this is what I think. I mean, this is not there, but they start to accuse each other. Why did we do this? Should we tell the truth to our father? All those stuff. Then, I mean, Judah found his way out. And that is where we see the story of Tamar coming in. I will not read the entire text, but I'll read what the Sabbath school gives to us. I think that gives us a clear picture of what happens there. Then we go back to the story of Joseph. So Judah finds a Canaanite woman after he left the brothers with whom he has three sons. So Judah had a 
the son Er, Onan, and Selah. Judah gives the Canaanite Tamar as wife to Er, his firstborn, in order to ensure proper genealogy. Genealogy we studied previously is an, a very important part that scripture is very serious about. So when Er and Onan are killed by God because of their wickedness, Judah promises his last son, Selah, to Tamar. I mean, if we read the text, uh, Genesis chapter 38, we realize that Er sinned, God killed him. And then the same thing as Onan, he also was killed. And then the last son, Selah, was supposed to be given to Tamar. And then Judah said he's still a young boy, so he will wait a while before Tamar gets Shana. Now, when after some time, Judah seems to have forgotten his promise, I think he had decided not to do. As he goes to comfort himself after the death of his wife, Tamar decides to play the prostitute in order to force him to fulfill his promise. Because Judah has no cash to pay the prostitute whom he does not recognize, he promises to send her later a good from his flock. I think we know the story, so this is just a summary of what the story is about. Now, Tamar requires that in the meantime, he give her his signet and cord and his staff as an immediate guarantee of payment. Tama will get pregnant from this unique encounter. And when later accused of playing the harlot, she will show to the accuser, Judah, his signet and cord and his staff. Judah understands and apologizes. Uh, one lesson that I learned from this is at times, the same act, the same evil that we do, we close our eyes to our sins and accuse people of the same thing. So we try to make ourselves holy and let people look bad. Uh, This is a typical example of what Judah did. So Tamar was also smart to to trick him in this act. And so the conclusion of this this story is the birth of Perez, meaning breaking through, who like Jacob is born second and becomes first and is named in salvation history as the ancestor of David and ultimately of Jesus Christ. As for Tamar, she is the first of the four women followed by Rahab, Ruth, and the wife of Uriah. We know Uriah, who genealogically preceded Mary, the mother of Jesus. Well, the lesson that we could learn from this is that we can, we can learn from this is just as God saved Tamar through his grace, transforming evil into good, so will he save his people through the cross of Christ. And in the case of Joseph, he will turn his troubles into the salvation of Jacob and his sons. Well, we'll see that in the later part of the study. Now, the question that I want us to discuss quickly before we continue with the story of Joseph is that how do we see the grace of God transforming evil into good in the life of Tama? I want somebody like if somebody could point something out from the life of Tama. How do we see the grace of God in the story of Tama transforming evil into good? Edma, okay, right. Yeah, I think Edma was first, so. The the story of, you know, Judah is for me one of the most, you know, uh, how can I say, strange story in the Bible, Hmm. right? Because, however, uh, Judah, you know, choose like a Canaanite, you know, to get married, you know, the, the mercy of God just read her, you know, bringing Jesus from this, you know, relationship. And right. this show, show me the grace of God over, not only over Tamar, Judah, and, and the, the Israelite, but over the wor- world. Right. Right. Because right. Jesus came from this root. Right. right. And mm-hmm. save us. 
However, you know, or besides the the wrong, you know, way man has chosen. Right. Thank you. Can, yeah. So Jesus is able to turn our evil into good. Yeah. Just like Tama is saying. Well, I don't know. Yeah. So Margaret, you want to add a point? Okay. I, I could add a, a, just a little to what Edmar said, but that main point that he made there. But the second point is one that I find um, a little strange in this story, mm. to think that a man who probably had many, many goats mm. uh, would, uh, and that's what he offered as payment, mm. was willing to surrender mm. so much in lieu of her getting that goat. I mean, right. he gave up his signet, his right. cord, and his staff. Yeah. That's a lot. The goat must have been awfully valuable right. <laughs> for him to say, I'm going to let you have all of that Definitely. while you're waiting for the goat. Right. So Tamar must have been a very persuasive person, mm. you know, for Judah to be able to make that kind of sacrifice. Right. And I think she was also, I mean, she was deceitful. She was as bad as the rest of them, mm. you know, um, guilty of fornication as well as deceit. But nevertheless, uh, again, bringing good out of the evil, if she hadn't ex uh, uh, um, requested that Joseph give her these items, um, Jacob give her these items, um, he would have, not, not Jacob, Judah, Judah, Judah give her yeah, these items. Judah. Too many ma names beginning with J here. <laughs> but no, if I... she hadn't requested that Judah give her these items, mm. He would have had no proof, or she would have had no proof Definitely. that he was actually that the one, one who had taken advantage of this situation. Right. So, you know, it's, a lot can be said about the evil and the right. good that resulted right. in, in this whole scene. Right. Yeah. Thank you so much, Margaret. Yeah, I want to, well, uh, Genesis chapter 39, well, it's my favorite chapter, and I want to read a few texts, and we continue with the, 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 the story of Joseph. Now, and Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down there. And the Lord was with Joseph. So, well, when I read this text, I really... Love it. And so the point is that, and the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. And Joseph found grace in, in his sight, and he served him, and he made him overseer over his house and all that he had he put him in his hands. And it came to pass from the time that he had made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. And he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he knew not what he had, save the bread which he did eat. And Joseph was a godly person and well favored. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph and she said, Lie with me. Well, I, I don't want, I will end here, but I want to jump to verse 21. The Bible says, But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. What we see in many parts where the Bible says, and the Lord was with Joseph. Well, in light of the example of Joseph's working as a manager under Potiphar, what are the factors that led to such a success? We have seen that Joseph was a successful man. If you, are, you look at this test, I want us to discuss some of the reasons that made Joseph a successful person in Potiphar's house. If people want to talk here, contribute 
what they think and what that means to us today. Yes, it's a question, yeah. So, well, maybe, well, let me repeat. So, like, the, the Sabbath school makes it clear that, well, with the reading that Joseph was a successful man. And so the question is, in the light of the example of Joseph working as a manager under Potiphar, he eventually became manager of a Potiphar's household. And so in this light, what are the factors that led to such a success? Would you point out anything from this and what lesson we could learn from that? Right. Well, there are two, two uh, verses in the Bible that mm. account for the success. Mm. Um, the first verse says, the Lord was with him, as you already said, mm. and Joseph recognized this. He knew that even though he was far away from his father and as the people of that time thought, the, the God of that land where his father lived, mm. uh, God was still with him, even mm. in Egypt. And mm. secondly, and I think equally important in Joseph's success, was what the next verse says, and that is that Potiphar realized that right. the Lord was with him. And we know that this was not Potiphar's God, but the people in that time uh, knew the, the value of having God, a God. Mm. And of course, we know there's only one true God, but they mm. didn't believe that way. But mm. having the value of a God working on your side. Mm. So if a God was working on Joseph's side, then Potiphar had someone good working for him so he could trust, you know, that this man would, would make him even more successful. Right. So I think it was the two factors, and, and, and it's beautiful that both of them involve God. Right, yeah, thank you, Margaret. Yeah, I think it, it's, it's clear that Joseph was a successful man from the test, and I mean, the secret is God. He, God was working through him to be successful. So the test makes it clear that the Lord was with him and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the king, I mean, Potiphar, and when he went to the prison, to in the sight of the prison keeper. And, and so, so the point is, like Margaret said, I mean, if somebody who doesn't believe in your God could see that the Lord is with you, then that is a great testimony to show how God is using you in the time. Because Potiphar, I believe, didn't believe in the God of Joseph, but, but Potiphar declares and testifies that that guy is, is really being used by God. And that is, great. And that is why it's, it's really interesting. Potiphar didn't know what is in his household. He is not interested. He doesn't care. As far as Joseph is there, he's okay. It's like, I trust the boy, and he's going to take care of everything. So all that Potiphar was concerned about is the food he would eat and all his wealth, his properties, he doesn't care because he knows that the boy is, is working for me. And I, I mean, if, if our, our bosses can trust us to that extent, then that would really demonstrate how God is with us and using us in, in our time. And that is really an interesting story. And one thing that, I mean, is so interesting is that Joseph's success, however, does not corrupt him. I mean, some of us, we rise to a certain position and we think everything is fine. We start doing whatever we want to do. So things we would not do, we go back and do them. But, but Joseph, after being successful in Potiphar's house, I want to believe that he met people there, but then he rise to be the boss over all the other servants. It doesn't corrupt him. And so when Potiphar's wife notices him and wants to sleep with him, Joseph unambiguously refuses and prefers to lose his job and his security rather than do this great wickedness and sin against God. Because we want to protect our job, we end up doing a whole lot of things which are not right in the sight of God. 
God, but Joseph is a man of integrity and he would not succumb to some of these things. This story is really interesting. Unfortunately, we have to summarize the lesson because it's coming to an end. While God blessed Joseph with dream, I mean, he's able to dream himself and he interprets dream and dreams get fulfilled in his life. He met these two guys, the butler and the baker in the prison. He, he interpreted their dreams to them and asked them to remember him, but they forgot the, the, the lesson. So I think after two years or something like that, then when Potiphar had a dream, the baker remembered there was a guy in the prison. Go find him. He can interpret your dreams. And now, the, the, so the interesting part is that when Joseph interpreted the dream of Potiphar, he makes it clear to Potiphar that it is not I who interpret this, but it is my God. And Potiphar saw, I mean, yeah, Pharaoh, sorry, Pharaoh also saw the God of Joseph and declared him the wise man, and I mean, he made him a minister over the land. Glory be to God. When the Lord is with you, evil things can be turned into good. And so I want to read this to summarize the lesson. In early life, if I we see some power between Joseph and Daniel, in early life, just as they were passing from youth to manhood, referring to Joseph and Daniel, they were separated from their homes and carried as captives to hidden lands especially was Joseph subject to the temptations that attend great changes of fortune. In his father's home, a tenderly cherished child in the house of Potiphar, a slave, then a confidant and companion, a man of affairs, educated by study, observation, contact with men in Pharaoh's dungeon, a prisoner of state condemned unjustly without hope of vindication or prospect of release, called at a great crisis to the leadership of the nation. What enabled him to preserve his integrity? Joseph faced a lot of troubles. He was condemned unjustly, but he would protect his integrity. So the question is, what will enable him to protect his integrity. May the Lord strengthen us so that when we are also faced with challenges, we can keep our integrity. And just as the Lord was with Joseph repeated many times in the book of Genesis chapter 39, the Lord will also be with us and we can overcome our challenges and maintain our love for God. Shall we pray? Daddy, we thank you so much for such an interesting story. It is an inspiration to know that you have worked through people to glorify your name. And so you can use us also just like you use Joseph and Daniel to glorify your name. We thank you for this lesson. And we pray, we do pray that you bless us with the Holy Spirit. Let him come and live with us. Let the Lord continue to be with us just like you were with Joseph and that you gave him favor and prosper in all his things. May you help us to overcome our weaknesses so that we can live for you and proclaim your name even to people who have not heard about you and have no belief in you. We want to continue to commit the rest of this I mean, the service into your hands. Come and be in charge and bless us today in Jesus' name. Amen.